on this edition. Mark and Patty McCloskey on defending your home according to the Second Amendment. Welcome to another Real American Heroes special edition. I'm Oliver North, and our guests today are Mark and Patty McCluskey of St. Louis, Missouri. You may well recognize the McCluskeys from the viral video of them protecting their home and their lives from vandals in a place called St. Louis, Missouri. Thank you very much for taking time to join us today. And I want you, if you would, to describe what was happening on the evening of Sunday, June 28th. What were you and Patty doing before the rioters showed up? Well, we just we had just come home. We were preparing to have dinner. Uh, we uh, typically have, when the weather permits, dinner out in the, the patio of the house. We had uh, gone out there. We were going to be barbecuing a pork loin. Uh, the, uh, we started hearing the protests down the street and uh, at the intersection of Maryland and Kings Highway, which is uh, two blocks away. And uh, the sound started to recede, like they were marching the other direction. And then it starts to get louder and louder and louder. And then we see a few people trickling up Kings Highway past the gate. Then all of a sudden, all of Kings Highway, the boulevard, 100 feet wide, fill, is filled wall to wall with a mass of humanity, all screaming and shouting and chanting. And as they come up towards the gate that separates Portland Place from Kings Highway, um, we look at each other and there's no police, there's no security, and all of a sudden the gate bursts open. And just seemingly everybody in the Western Hemisphere, this horde of people come through the gate. Half of the gate swings open and can be forced, and apparently was. The other half of the gate is fixed in place with a stake and a concrete, and they just folded that over and came over it like, like uh, lemmings jumping off the cliff, just people piling over each other to get in. And uh, uh, Patty ran in to call 911, and I ran in to, to grab my AR. Had, had there been a, a growing set of circumstances that, that led up to this event? You know, after the, uh, the George Floyd death on June 1st and 2nd, I guess, yeah. rioting took place throughout downtown St. Louis. And you have to understand, your audience needs to understand that we aren't very far from downtown St. Louis. Uh, and uh, buildings were burned, uh, looting took place. There was essentially no police present. We watched on, on a uh, live uh, helicopter feed, the 7-Eleven in downtown St. Louis have the window broken out, looted, and then firebombed, and then watched it burn and become fully engulfed, engulfed in flames. 30 or 40 minutes of live TV while we're watching this, no, no police response, no fire response. And we looked at each other and said, my God, we're, we're all alone here. If this happens, uh, there's no, nobody to save us. That same night, retired uh, police captain uh, David Dorn gets murdered outside a pawn shop not very far from here, where he was working secondary employment. And, and then the group that's sponsoring all this, called Expect Us, puts out a flyer saying they're going to go march on the, on the mayor's house, which is not our neighborhood, by the way, and something special. And they specifically said that they did not, their organization was not designed to have peaceful protests, but specifically needed to break the law, shake things up, and make things as, as disquieting as possible. They specifically advertised what they were going to do is not be peaceful, but be violent. Patty, when, when you got through to 911, what did they say? Um, they, I, I told them that the people were coming in the gate, that they had broken the gate down, they were rushing toward the house, and they said, are they um, African Americans, are they Caucasians, are they Hispanics? And I said, yes, everybody. And then I said, wait, no, there's no, probably no Hispanics, but, um, but, but please send somebody right away. And then that's the last thing I remember saying, and then I put the phone down, and when I came I just assumed they were sending somebody. And then when I went by the front door, I saw that they seemed to be coming up the, the, toward the front of the house, like as if to break in um, or start a fire or, and that's when I grabbed a thing that was a gun like substance <laughs> and um, went out there to stop them from starting a fire, breaking the windows in. Sure. And, and obviously you're protecting your own lives and your property, which uh, I, I, I've got this remarkable document called the Constitution of the United States here. And, and, <laughs> Wait a second. Turn, you, can't, you, can't, you can't quote well, that anymore. That's un-American to quote the Constitution. Well, I, I'm obviously a bigot because I carry a copy of it. <laughs> and so the Second Amendment reads, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. How the heck can you guys be charged with a crime 
by a local prosecutor when this document applies to every American. I don't understand. Well, read, and read, read the First Amendment. It guarantees people the right to peaceably sure. assemble. Right? Well, this Not doesn't sound riot. very peaceable to me. I mean, you've got rioters, vandals, people who have been obviously looting and burning. What are they saying to you as, as you guys are standing there on your, on your own property? Well, the first thing that happened when, the, when the, the horde broke through the fence and I'm standing out in the patio, I say, this is private property. Go back. Get out of my neighborhood. Then they keep coming. And I promise to get the hell out of my neighborhood. Um, and as soon as I said the phrase private property, that seemed to inflame them. It seemed that the concept of private property was uh, was an insult to them, which they had to rectify. It really, they really started to pour through faster and come in. You know, the uh, the concept of, of a, a peaceful protest has been redefined in current America. I think they want us to accept the definition of peaceful, meaning spray painting everything they can reach, breaking anything they can touch, setting fires and smashing cars, and all that now fits within the, the definition, at least in their mind, of what constitutes a peaceful protest. And you're just supposed to accept it. <laughs> well, I guess we're creating a whole new set of definitions in, as a consequence of the COVID virus and uh, the, the free reign that rioters, and as I put it, vandals, yeah. have been doing what they've been doing. I mean, you've lost, you've lost a very senior police officer in the midst of all of this. This kind of stuff, it seems to me, is out of control. And, and I know that there's a lot of criticism of the, of, of the way that the federal government is handling things like what's going on in Portland. But you've got your own challenges right there in your neighborhood. And as I understand it, the prosecutor who's brought, bringing these charges against you is an elected official and up for re-election in a primary that's going to be, what, a week or so from now? August the 4th is a primary. Yeah, she's, a, she's an elected official um, and uh, uh, works on the, on the public dime. And uh, in this circumstance, I mean, everybody that broke into our neighborhood was a, uh, was a criminal, at least of trespassing. Uh, and by the way, they were threatening us and, and assaulting us with words and threats um, and just the physical presence of them. None of those people have been charged with anything. Uh, as, an, as an example, uh, there is a big statue of Louis IX on horseback in front of our art museum in Ford Park. So the, the uh, Catholic saint for whom St. Louis is named, right. there were some Catholics praying in front of it the day before our event, and some uh, Antifa, Black Lives Matter guys beat him up. The fellow that did the beating was on television admitting that he did the beating, saying he would do it again, and the guy that he beat up deserved it because he was white. That fellow got charged with a misdemeanor. We get charged with a felony for defending our house against those people. The, uh, the thing that, that the media hasn't reported enough is that we then got inside information that they were coming back the uh, following Friday to kill us and burn the house, coming back en masse. And so we started to uh, try to hire security and figure out what would go on. By Thursday afternoon, every private security company didn't want the bad press of being here in case so they had to shoot somebody and it would get on the national press. So at about three o'clock in the afternoon on that Thursday, I called 911 to see if I could talk to the area commander and see what, if anything, the St. Louis Police Department was gonna do. For the first 20 minutes, it says, 911 operators not available, don't hang up, stay on the line. Close loop of that for 20 minutes. Then finally, a, uh, an officer gets on the phone, a 911 uh, uh, receptionist, and I tell the story and I said, I need to speak to the area commander. She puts me on hold. Finally, a uniform officer comes on, say the whole story again. She says, would you like to talk to my lieutenant? I said, yeah. And she put me on hold for a long time. Nobody comes on. Finally, she comes back on and says, would you like the lieutenant to call you back? And I said, yes. And it never happened. And that's when my next, my next phone call was to Tucker Carlson. And uh, he put it out on the news that, that we were in a tough situation, that we had no help. And, uh, and we've been told to just walk away from the house and let them burn it. Yeah, that's what the last security company said. A fellow that uh, has a special forces a security team that does private security all over the world. He said, "Just my advice to you at this point is just abandon your house and go and, and leave. And I just, you know, we were not going to do that. And then, you know, as an end result of all this, and a large part due to uh, Tucker Carlson's support, we had SEAL team guys here that Friday. We had 10 or so. Uh, secondary employment, local police guarding the house. We had the chief of the St. Louis Police Department, Chief Hayden, 
show up in front of our house, meet with our private security, talk about the best strategy for dealing with the mob. And then the chief himself stayed in front of the house most of the night and would go up to the fence and confront the, the mob whenever it started to surge against the fence and talk them down. And our guys were there looking, you know, he, the chief suggested that we make a big show of force, but not of weapons. And so our guys put away their guns or put them behind things where you couldn't see them, but were very obviously uh, meaningful, tough guys. And it worked out the way it was supposed to work out. The, uh, uh, the, the rioters, I'm sorry, you can't say that word anymore. The, uh, the, the um, protesters stayed on their side of the fence. Um, they were out loud. They were angry. They were not permitted to break anything or do any violence. And then eventually they moved on. But they, you know, on many occasions between that first event on June 28th and now, the mob has shown up at the mayor's house and tried to burn it repeatedly. On that first night on June 28th, after they left here and went on to the mayor's house by going through Portland Place and going out the other gate, um, a Channel 5 local news reporter, female, with her private security. And Colonel, think about this. The media embedded in this mob, I'm sorry, you can't say that word either now, embedded in this uh, angry group of people. They have private security. If they're so certain that this is a peaceful mob, why do they have armed guards walking with them? But anyway, when the, when, when the mob gets to the mayor's house, one of these Channel 5 reporters is confronted by a rioter with an AR, uh, no, an AK-47 rifle. Her security then is about to draw down on the guy with the AK, and then the reporter, her security, and her cameraman flee the area. That's how nonviolent and how peaceful this crowd was that night. Mark and uh, Patty, I, I pray that all is going to stay well with you guys and that level heads will prevail ultimately in all of this and that if there are charges that are levied and you have to face those kinds of things, that at least the governor, who's got some authority out there still, does the right thing. I think it's and, called, and, it's and, called and a our, and, Eric, and Eric Schmidt, our attorney general, he's, he's doing the right thing. But I, I've got a question for you, Colonel. What sure. do you see the future to be where, where, go, where governors and mayors of cities um, support the riots and, and, and give them security yeah. and, and a safe place to riot? Look, What's going to happen to our country? Well, I, my prayer is that my kids and my grandkids, and we got 18 grandkids, are going to look at this thing and do the right thing at the ballot box in November. And each time there's an opportunity to elect somebody who believes, I, look, the American people are not nuts. There's a bunch of crazies like you've confronted out in, on your property. The, and there's a bunch of rioters and vandals that do terrible things around our country. But the bottom line, what most American people want is a safe home, a safe street, a, a safe city, a place to live in comfort where we can enjoy the fruits of liberty. And the ideas of our founders, which are in that document, and we all know it and you know it, ours is the only country in the world with a founding document that requires every authority, whether it's military or civil or a judge or law enforcement, they raise their right hand and they take an oath to defend the Constitution of the United States. There's no other country in the world that does that. All those oaths in those other countries are, are to some potentate, some prince, or, or some pantheon. And what we've got is something different. And our kids have got to know that because we're not always going to be here. I'm not always going to have great friends like you who face what you did if our kids do the right thing at the ballot box in November. You know, friends, if that story inspires you like it does me, I want you to let me know. And, Subscribe and let me know how these unprecedented events have affected you and yours and become part of the historical record on how America persevered. Until next time, remember, Semper Fidelis is more than a slogan for U.S. Marines. Always faithful is a way of life.